I'm very pleased uh, today to be able to introduce some of our previous uh, fellowship recipients who are going to talk a little bit about the projects that they've done. Um, I'll introduce them one at a time. They've promised to uh, remain within the confines of a 15-minute presentation. Closer to 10 would even be great. Um, not to cut you off, I'm sure you have many interesting things to tell us about your work. Um, our first presenter today is um, Julia Hlebach, is that right? Who is, um, has been to St. Petersburg, uh, where she completed some language study. And the title of her presentation is Russia, Country of Possibilities. Hi, as most of you know, I'm Julia. Um, I am a undergraduate senior double majoring in the program in the environment and Russian Eastern European studies. This summer I received the FLAS and I study abroad in St. Petersburg, Russia for two months. Um, there's a link to my blog if people want to see uh, more details about what I did abroad. So why FLAS is great. The summer flats that I received covered $5,000 in tuition and $2,500 in a stipend. And so my tuition for the program that I went through, which was CIEE, required all that money. And within that was included meals and also all of our excursions. So that was really good. And um, I would highly suggest for anyone that applies for the FLAS to budget your money because that way I didn't actually have to worry about my finances all summer, which was really, really nice. Um, so what I learned, I went through CIEE, like I said, it was eight weeks long. It was the language intensive program and we stayed with homestay families. And our campus was at the Smolny Cathedral in St. Petersburg, which was the blue cathedral on the first slide. <clears throat> I gained nine semesters worth of credit and upon returning to U of M, I was able to skip fourth year Russian and go straight into fifth year. The program included core classes of Russian grammar, phonetics, and conversation, and then also electives, which were current events, music, film, and culture. And then we also had weekly cultural excursions, um, which were museums, monuments, and trips, including a week-long trip to Moscow. So that's from the trip to Moscow. That was our overnight trip to Novgorod, and this was one of our uh, trips around St. Petersburg for the Siege of Leningrad. We also took a day trip to Pla Pavlovsk, and um, there was excursions every week, so there was a lot to do. All of our tours that we went on were in Russian. The program was really good about getting us only guides that spoke to us in Russian, which was challenging, but also really helpful because it helped us expand our vocabulary a lot. And the guides were really good at speaking slowly, and we could ask a lot of questions. And if we didn't understand something, they would explain it to us in Russian. So that was really helpful. Um, this is my host mom, Lida Semenovna. She, um, or each homestay varied for students. So some people had, you know, entire families with children. Some just had a host mom like I did. Uh, she was great because she would help me with my homework all the time. And she was required to cook for me. And she was really <laughs> calm and understanding, and she would speak slowly with me. And she also would hold my hand when we crossed the street. So it was really like having a mom that was looking out for you the whole time. So that was nice. So some people might ask why you would want to go to school in the summer. I went during the White Nights Festival. So this is actually at 1130 at night. This is later in the summer. Usually it stayed light out until like 2 in the morning. So it's not all hard work, it's fun too. This was our 4th of July excursion to the Baltica Brewery followed by a beer tasting. This was a trip to a banya, a Russian bathhouse. And you get to experience a lot of different cultures. This is some Russian blini, which are like Russian crepes. So you get to do a lot, it's not just work. And you also have a lot of great experiences. That's with me with some of my friends watching the bridges go up at one in the morning and watching fireworks over Moscow. Um, Life-changing experiences. So I thought it was really important to always ask questions. There really wasn't such a thing as a dumb question. If you want to learn about a different culture, you're going to have to go out of your comfort zone and really learn how other people are living. So that includes trying things that you normally wouldn't, even foods. But I thought it was really important to also say when I was not comfortable with something or if I didn't like something. Um, 
I think you should be smart, but I also learned a lot by talking to strangers. Russians really like to open up and tell you about their history and their culture. So I found that even if I was at a restaurant and I asked a question to someone, they would just talk forever and just, you know, in 10 minutes explain Russian history to me. So they really like to share what they know um, and make it right for you. So for me, I was focused on gaining a year's worth of Russian. So I would hang out with the more advanced groups and um, I would meet w with Russian friends and just really worked on improving my language, whereas some people just focused on being in Russia and partying. So <laughs> that was a different experience for them. Highlights of my trip were making Russian friends, which I still stay in contact with today. So one of my friends, um, I would... I translated his resume for him while I was there and now when I'm in Russian class and I have some questions that I can't figure out I can email him and then he'll email me back and help explain things to me so that was really helpful and we'll even just chat um, on the internet and he'll correct my Russian and I'll correct his English at the same time. Um, I gained confidence speaking in a different language which is you kind of just have to you know learn how to think on your feet because you're gonna have to buy that bus ticket for yourself or you're gonna have to order that food for yourself and so you really have to become comfortable knowing the language and um, meeting influential people which I'll talk about in my next slide and also networking for the future so I had a girl in my group who was from Washington and her Russian teacher back there was interested in the environment and Russian and done a lot of research on that. So I got her email and that's a good contact for me to use next semester when I'm working on, you know, my senior paper. So I thought that was really important. And also living abroad, it's something that you can't do whenever, you know, it's best to do it now when you're young and you're not settled down. So that was really important to me and definitely something I would want to do again. Um, that was our trip to Novgorod. Those are my Russian friends, and that's my other Russian friend. So St. Petersburg, Bohemia. So I had a friend in Chicago who was Russian and lived in Chicago during the year and then lived in St. Petersburg over the summer. So I got in contact with him and told him I would be there. And he really went above and beyond to make sure I really got the true Russian experience. So I would stay with them on weekends sometimes, and he introduced me to what I like to call the St. Petersburg, Bohemia, which is the art scene of St. Petersburg. And one of the greatest things I learned with him is while we were having a conversation one day and I was asking him a lot of questions, he was telling me that his father had been an architect during the Soviet Union and had actually been one of the head architects for the panel apartments, which are actually all over Eastern Europe and are really, you know, a statement of the Soviet period. So his dad was an esteemed Soviet citizen. So that was something really interesting to me and probably one of the greatest highlights of my trip. And I also got to meet up with old friends. This is me with my friend Louis, who also was a FLAS recipient, and he was studying abroad at Moscow State University. So when I was in Moscow, I met up with him, and he showed me his school and showed me around. And then when he came to St. Petersburg, I took him out and showed him some of my favorite spots. And it was also good because we got to compare our experiences and see how our Russian was improving um, through the different programs and what had helped us from our program at home. Um, and this, then I made a new friend who had a very similar background to me. I usually spend my summers in the Czech Republic, and she spent her summers in Russia. And she was from Michigan, um, not University of Michigan, but she was born and raised in Michigan. And she spent her summers in Russia. And so we really got along, and she showed me a different kind of Russia, you know, she had a dacha summer house there, so she took me there. And even when I was with her, I would speak a lot of Russian, but at the same time, if I couldn't say something, I could say it in English, and they would translate it for me. So that was really helpful. And we still stay in touch now, and she also helps me with my homework when I need it. So it's another good contact that I got. It was also great to explore a new city. You really become a local in this different place that you've never been to before. So that was a really great experience. And I learned that a lot of times it's hard to coordinate with other people in the program because everyone kind of has their own agenda. So there were days where I would just, you know, really map out what I wanted to see in the city. And I would go and spend a whole day just touring by myself, which in some ways is better than being with a group of people who can't decide what to do. So I think that if you're studying abroad, you should really do what is best for you. And this is me receiving my certificate at the end of the program. We had really great program directors. They would go out with us and have fun, but they were also really strict about the academics. So it was a good combination of having someone to rely on, but also having friends. 
So if you are to apply for FLAS, I would suggest that you talk a lot about your future goals and also tie in like your past accomplishments and include a lot of personal experiences. So that was really important for me. I wanted to show what I had learned in the past, what my goals were for the future, and how I was going to tie that together. Of course, you should proofread because you want your FLAS application to look professional. And then you're going to have to do a language report if you receive a FLAS. And now that I've been abroad, I find it really easy to fill that out because I just draw on past experiences. So the FLAS will say, you know, if you're buying a bus ticket, how would you go about doing that? And I think back to the time where I had to help my friends buy bus tickets. And it's really makes the process a lot easier. So you have a lot of past experiences to draw on. So I encourage everyone to apply for FLAS, both academic and um, the summer one. And if there's any questions, it's also my email in case you need to email me questions. How long have you been there? I was there for two months. Yeah. Um, just a couple quick questions. You said you stayed with the host family. Mm -hmm. um, did your stipend uh, like help pay them or do they do it voluntarily? Well the flas paid from the FLAS paid for my tuition, and within the tuition was the homestay price. So the host moms were paid a certain amount, which covered them letting us stay, cost for you know any utilities, and also it gave them money to buy us food and cook for us. And the other question I had had to do with your credits. Mm -hmm. You said you, um, you, you arranged uh, with U of M your credit hours uh, so that you know that when your experience is over, you actually get uh, uh, the green credits. Yeah, well, CIEE works specifically with U of M during the academic year. They don't have the summer program set up, but credits will still transfer. But since they work specifically with CIEE, that's all, you know, sorted out for how many credits for how many um, hours and how much time you spend abroad. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Uh, our next speaker is uh, Paulina Duda, who is a um, PhD student in the Slavic Languages and Literature program. She did some pre-dissertation research on Polish-Lithuanian relationships during World War II in Lithuania. Uh, the title of her project is The Polish-Lithuanian Complex, Tadeusz Konwicki's Notion of Identity and Its Cinematic Representation. So welcome everybody. Um, after listening to Julia's enthusiastic talk about uh, the great country of, of possibilities, be prepared for something far gloomier, right? I'm going to talk about um, about complexes, namely about uh, Polish complexes, and actually maybe about Polish-Lithuanian complexes. I'm working on that, so I'm trying. I will show you uh, why I'm not sure about that yet, and what I've researched in uh, Lithuania. So those of you who are familiar with Polish literature, I'm, I'm sure some of you are, um, know that actually the, Poli uh, the Polish complex uh, is the novel written by uh, Tadeusz Konwicki, this is the gentleman, uh, who is uh, at the same time a very famous filmmaker as well. And so it happened that his life and his works um, are um, the main focus of my um, ongoing project. And um, so far I n investigated how um, the impossibility of communication between people affected by World War II memories were presented in his cinema, because that's something that he obsessively goes back to in all of his seven films. He made seven films. Whoa, oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> all right, here we are. So um, uh, when I was um, something, uh, what I was researching so far inevitably brought me to Tadeusz Konwicki's um, uh, biography uh, itself because he was born in pre-war Vilnius and as you know it was still a part of Poland back then and he was um, uh, he was a partisan of a ho of the Home Army unit and he was fighting Lithuanian woods during the World War II. So I was thinking that maybe this uh, his Polish complex together with his obsession with war memories and together with his birthplace had something in common. So I was thinking maybe I should go back to the source of this um, uh, of this issue, try to investigate it, what, what really happened at the very beginning, because his notion of his own identity, even though he stresses in his own words that he's like really Polish, but there is something about a Lithuanian part um, of his soul, we, we, we could say too. So I was trying to investigate it, and then that was the point when I decided to 
apply to Chris for some money. And I got it. That's why I am here. Um, thank you for that. Um, and so I was trying to be a bit cunning. So I was thinking, OK, I got the money to go to Lithuania. I should use it for research and I should do something else. Right. So I, um, I decided to apply. I, I wanted to maybe present some of my research during the conferences there. So actually, I got accepted to the 10th International Conference uh, in Kaunas. Uh, the conference war was enti entitled Exploring, Exploring Culture, Consumption, Organization and Communication. And you can see that that's the place. Those are people from the conference. Um, and so I gave a talk on Polish popular uh, cinema. Um, it wasn't anything related to Tadeusz Konwicki, but still it was within my professional expertise that I'm trying to pursue. Uh, but, but actually, mm, while being at the conference, one talk gave by a professor, her name is Victoria Zilinskaite. She's, you can see her on the picture. Uh, on your right hand, uh, she gave a very uh, rather interesting and yet controversial talk about the um, uh, Lithuanian uh, identity um, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And so she was trying to explain how how does the Lithuanian identity look like uh, uh, look like. And the first question from the audience after her, her talk was. Um, it seems like you try to describe Lithuanian identity as something that it's not Polish and not Russian. So for those of you who know something about the history, um, you understand that it was quite a contro controversial point to make. And so you can imagine the heated debate afterwards. Uh, some, so some people even uh, got offended. But this made me think that it fits very well with it fitted very well with my um, research question because I was thinking what the, how did the relation the Polish rela uh, Polish uh, Lithuanian relationships looked like back in the Second World War and even though she was talking about uh, contemporary Lithuania this shed the light of how did those relations look in the past. So perhaps unsurp uh, unsurprisingly, um, uh, my visit to Vitauta's Great War Museum brought similar effect. So here is the museum. It's me standing in front of it. It looks like a huge building, but actually it's one of those buildings where it's just a huge space inside and a few paintings on the wall. And all like, uh, oh, I'm not to be, I'm not trying to be mean, but it was one of those museums that you actually leave without knowing much. Uh, so all I just, I can show you just one picture that I took, I mean, it, I was not allowed to take pictures, that's why the, the quality is very bad, but all what you could read there, it was the title in Lithuanian, then in English, and then the name of the writer, and that's all. There were no flyers, additional information about, um, about paintings or anything else apart from that. But I took this picture because it's a reproduction of a very famous uh, painting of uh, about the, of uh, the uh, Battle of Grunwald. So it's like a, a point where the, the Polish and, and uh, Lithuanian history um, unites together. And what's funny, uh, like me coming from Poland, I know that when we study the Battle of Gr uh, Grunwald, the main hero of the battle is Władysław Jagiello, while here the main um, hero of the battle is his cousin who was uh, actually trying to kick him out from Lithuania. So he didn't want to have anything to do with, Pol uh, with Poland. And so the, uh, this gentleman in the, uh, in the center of the painting is actually him, is Vitautas, who is at the same time the very national hero of Lithuania. So I thought that was interesting too from that very perspective. So after finishing my research in Kaunas, I went to Vilnius and my the library, the Vrublevsky uh, Library of the Lithuanian Academy of Science became my home for five days. wasn't easy and wasn't pleasant at all. Not because, um, not because it was a. I mean, in terms of the the, the amount of man Polish manuscripts and documents they have, it's incredible. You just need to spend there two months, not five days, I guess. Because the problem is that uh, they didn't have any uh, online catalogs. And then, of course, going through these little cards with names is also good. But it's good when you when you have the, the names index, uh, indexed according to the original names, while there, they everything that was written in Polish 
or in English because they have documents uh, written in English as well, or in German and Russian, it was all translated to Lithuanian, and then you had to find a keyword that actually corresponded to what you were trying to, s to find. But anyway, after five days, I realized that there wasn't that much written about the Polish um, Home Army, but actually I found very interesting propaganda documents written in Polish um, about the inferiority of Lithuanian nation. So I thought this was very um, interesting, and all of them, I, I think I found two or three. Um, probably that they have more, so they were uh, written before the World War II. So I, it was interesting to see the other side uh, of the coin a bit. Um, but you know that the, the, the main... Um, I, I, I wanted to really see how Tadeusz, what's the role of Tadeusz Konwicki, in because he was born in Vilnius, right? So I was thinking, okay, let's keep him in, my, in mind. And I was trying to find the places where he was born and what the Lithuanians know, what do they teach uh, with respect to Tadeusz Konwicki. And actually, they, 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 they don't do anything or they don't do much. And very surprising, especially he's uh, he's really a prominent writer nowadays and still alive. Um, so uh, I was trying only because I read all of or all um, all of his novels, I was able to trace the places where he was born uh, to see the places that, um, about which he, he was writing and he was um, talking about in the in many, many interviews. So I went to Nova Vileka, which is now Yoli Vilnia, that's how it's called in Lithuanian, and that was the place when he was born uh, before the war. Um, it's still the most Polish district of Vilnius, and at the same time the poorest one. It's rather a dodgy place, not very nice to go there around. I was trying to make a little surveys, asking people around on the street whether they heard about somebody like Tadeusz Konwicki. Nobody did, but yeah, I, I hope it's not because he's a bad writer, but I think it's just, he's not famous there, or maybe people are not interested. But what's interesting about this place is like, that's the point where the history of, again, Poland and Lithuania, uh, Polish and Lithuanian tragedies uh, unite again because uh, mm, the uh, train station in Nova Vileka is actually like the central point of his uh, of Konwicki's novels, and at the same time, it was the place where uh, from which during the World War II and even up to the 50s, uh, Lithuanians and Poles were um, were uh, taken to Siberia. So that that was the main point of meeting, right? They were gathering many dissidents, um, many the Polish and Lithuanians, and they were sending them to Lithuania or um, even to Kazakhstan. And so there is a even commemorating um, sculpture um, of this. Okay. And this, uh, how am I doing on time? Am I okay? Okay, thank you. So this is something that I do, uh, well, it's difficult to explain in, in three sentences, but the upper pictures are the pictures, that those are the stills from Konwitzki's films. They were shot not in Lithuania. None of his films were, uh, were shot in Lithuania. They were shot in central Poland. And those are actually the places that I went to. So, you know, it was like reading uh, uh, Ulysses by Joyce and trying to walk around different streets and trying to realize, oh, are, am I here or not? So that's what I did with his books. And I found all the uh, important points like the the lake where uh, many important things happened in his, his life, the, 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 the rail trails, yeah. So, uh, and it, in his films, even though he, in that film, the, 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 the two stills from the, mm, from the films, they were, he refers to the place, the, the action of the, fil uh, the film takes uh, place in a, Polish pl in a Polish city. So he never says it's Lithuania, but actually even though his heroes are, mm, are Polish, uh, the places that he calls in his films are Polish, um, he actually draws off uh, on his memories that he took from Lithuania. What's interesting, he never came, I mean, he came back once to Lithuania after he left Lithuania um, in 1945, and then he came back just once to visit Vilnius and that's all. He never wanted to go back there. Um, so yeah, uh, apart from this, I think Vilnius and the fact that I get, I, got, uh, I had this great opportunity of traveling there and I got this finan fi financial support. Apart from this, um, the research that I did, and I think it was great for my um, dissertation, and I, I even submitted uh, one article to a journal, so I'm still waiting for, for, the, uh, for the reviews. Uh, Vilnius is great to visit, f to like I would recommend to go to Vilnius to anybody who is um, interested in doing Central or East European studies. 
you can, I mean, it's the heart, it was the heart of Polish Romanticism. It's the heart of many uh, important events that took place um, in the cu cultural lives of different nations, um, including Polish, uh, German, Russian, Lithuanian, Jewish, especially too. And so, yeah, and I met there my boyfriend. I don't know, any guesses who is that? Yes, of course. So Mitskevich is everywhere. Uh, Vilnius is like Mitskevich's home. So if you go there, you 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 will be sure you will meet him in any. I mean, every church, every place. It's it's Mitskevich. So thank you, Chris, for helping me completing my uh, research. And yeah, I I recommend everybody to 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 apply for research. Thank you. Yeah, please. They so were. Ah, uh, yeah. So Lithuanian case is a bit, you know, ambiguous. Uh, yes, um, especially when we talk about Vilnius, because Vilnius was always a place that every nation wanted to get hold of, including Poles, including Lithuanians, uh, Russians, and Germans. But of course, Germany invaded uh, Lithuania, uh, Vilnius, I think in 1942, as early as then. And then, so Russians were trying to side with um, with Lithuanians, telling them, okay, let's get rid of Germans together, and then, you know, you will get Lithuania as well, but the problem was that also the the Polish were there, right? And Poles, they didn't want to get rid of Lithu uh, of Vilnius either. So it was a, in a way, it was a place where many different for for forces were, were uh, battling. But going to the second part of the question about concentration camps, there were ghettos for sure. I think in Vilnius there were two, one of the biggest Jewish ghettos were, were um, in Vilnius. Um, Concentration camps, I'm not sure. I think, I'm not sure, I'm not sure because I think, I'm not sure if it was the, back then the part of Lithuania was already Belarus. So that's, I, I would hesitate. I'm not about this, but get this, yes, for sure. Because like the huge Jewish population lived there. Young left, right? Uh, you mean get this? No, I mean, yeah, I mean, are, are there any Jews living in... They, they, yeah, there are still some, but obviously the, nothing comparable. I think uh, pre-war uh, Vilnius, uh, the highest uh, percentage of citizens, they were Polish, then they were Jewish. Lithuanians, I think they um, added up up to 2% of population in Vilnius. So, yeah, uh, that's un astonishing. Like, yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? This means I'm free. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Jess Beck, who is a um, PhD student in the anthropology department. She uh, completed a bioarchaeological research project in Spain and in Portugal, I believe, death and burial in Copper Age Iberia. Okay, so my name is Jess. Um, I am, oh, well, that went quickly. Okay, uh, I'm an archeologist, and so we're going to kick everything <coughs> back a few thousand years, um, and I will go a little bit into archaeological methodology since it seems like a slightly more arcane field than what other people have been talking about today. But I used CES funding this past summer to, um, to visit two different areas. The first is um, the town of Torres Vedras in Portugal, about 40 kilometers north of Lisbon, and the second is the city of Cayenne. Um, to look at a museum collection there, and that's in South Central Spain. So I did get the opportunity to go <coughs> all of, over Iberia. Okay, so first off, what do I do? I'm a bioarchaeologist, which um, basically means that I look at human bones. I use the methods of biological anthropology or physical anthropology to answer archaeological questions. Um, so the sorts of preliminary data that bioarchaeologists collect involve minimum number of individuals, so how many people are buried at a site, um, what the age of those individuals was, is it, is it all adults, is it a combination of adults and juveniles, are there a lot of infants, um, and then we can also estimate sex, so are women being treated, or are males being treated differently than females, um, and look at various aspects of health. So does anyone know what this bone is? Would anyone be willing to hazard a guess? It's, at an, it's in an odd view, so. 
Nope, um, those are good guesses. That's actually the superior portion of your tibia, which is the weight-bearing bone in your lower leg, so this bone right here. Um, and this is actually uh, somewhat um, misleading because this bone is from an archaic population in Illinois uh, and not Portugal, but it was a good example of what I wanted to show you guys, which is um, osteoarthritis. So the surface of this bone is very porous and almost polished and smooth, and that, that happens when you have bone-on-bone -bone rubbing. Um, after the synovial fluid and, and um, joints deteriorate with age. Uh, so that's an indication of high activity levels, and that can vary between populations and between subgroups. So maybe you have women who are more active than men, or maybe um, women are using certain bones differently, for example. So there's been a lot of studies of, uh, of like grain preparation practices where you see a lot of damage to the knees and ankle joints because people are sitting and, and grinding. Um, various types of grains. And then, what is this one? This is an easier one. Yeah. Yeah, so that's that's um, a view of your maxilla, uh, sort of looking superior. Yeah, exactly. Um, but it's a good example of dental health in prehistory, which most of the time was terrible. Yes, as you can see, and I believe, yeah, there's some resorption too, so some of the teeth have fallen out. Um, and there's, there's some caries and dental attrition and other lovely things like that uh, that are very interesting to a person like me. So these are the sorts of data uh, that bioarchaeologists collect, and they help us to examine the relationship between biology and culture in prehistory. All right. So where I went this summer um, was the site of Bolorish, which is located right here. You can't see it that well, but um, it's on a ridge that's crusting up over a river valley, and there's actually a river that runs right in between this line of trees, and there is another site, again dated to the late Neolithic, early Copper Age, that's a few hilltops over, only two kilometers away. Um, and Bolorish is just a mortuary site. It's, it's an artificial mortuary rock shelter um, where people buried their dead for about a thousand years, and they probably came from the site that's just over that hill. All right, so um, Bolorish has been excavated by a University of Iowa team, uh, and they started in 2007, and 2012 marked the end of the excavation of the site. Um, I actually worked there in 2010 also, but I wanted to return with a more advanced knowledge of osteology, or human bones, basically. Um, and so this is me in 2010. You can tell because that's the right side of my head, and clearly my hair has grown out. Um, and I'm working probably on excavating a, a child if it was 2010. And one of our most interesting finds that year was um, this stone tool. And it's a flint blade, and I put my trowel in for scale right there. And those are actually very difficult to make, so that was something that would have been this long. And it was, um, it was one of my favorite experiences on an archeological site because we had a cranium, someone's skull basically. We removed the cranium and that blade was right underneath it. So it was a very clear delineation of um, deposition. Uh, yeah, but the, the project I was working on was, um, it's called SARP, so it's uh, Cisandru Alcabriquel Research Project, and the Cisandru is the river that flows through the valley, so it is named for the location. But um, the project examines sort of uh, the paleoecology and, and social behavior of humans who've lived in the region um, during that time period. And 2012 was the last season of excavation, so we got a lot of the site down to the shale bedrock, not all of it. In archaeology, good practice is to leave something for the future in case, you know, technology uh, moves at a breakneck pace and perhaps people will find some way to collect more data out of the material that's been preserved. All right, um, yeah, this is me at the total station. Uh, this is sort of our basic methodology. What we would do is we would excavate um, as level a plane as possible until we had so much bone, and this was a, a commingled site, so there was a ton of bone, um, until we could excavate no further, take a picture, plot everything in using the total station, which is this device. It's the same device you see land surveyors using, even when they're working around cities. Um, and so we'd map everything in and sync it up with the photos, basically. So you can kind of recreate the site using photos. Um, and the site's radiocarbon dated to 2800 to 1800, that should say BC, uh, years before present. So it has an enormous use life, spanning a thousand years. People have been coming back to this one area and depositing human remains. Um, and previous MNIs, or minimum numbers of individuals, suggested there were 14 people 
six adults, two juveniles, and six children buried at the site, which is an unusually high number of children, which makes it a very interesting place to work. So some key features, it's, um, it's a commingled burial site. So a lot of different people have been deposited there. It, it isn't a nice, neat cemetery where you have a headstone and then you dig and you know exactly where the body is. You spend a lot of your time tracing out you know, a humerus that is going under part of someone else's pelvis, which is sitting right on top of some vertebrae. And then you, know, you have other remains coming in too. So a lot of it looks like this. It's just an enormous jumble that needs to be excavated with care. There's little material culture. So that lithic blade that you saw was one of the few artifacts that we actually found. Mainly it's just bones. There's a large number of child burials. Um, it's been used for a long time. And this is a settlement of Zambujal, which has been excavated for a German team over the past 20 odd years. They've, they've been going back to the site for a while. Um, and most likely the people at Bolorish are coming from Zambujal. This is sort of their homestead. It's a big fortified settlement. Okay, so um, this past year, this is me. Anyone want to guess what this bone is? Oh. Nope, good guess though. Th this is actually part of a pelvis. It's an anominate bone. Uh, we had that guess earlier, but I was very pleased with myself for excavating it without damaging it too much. Um, and this is actually the view out onto the river valley, so you can see the river streaming forward there. Uh, most of the work we did involved taking down this area. Um, so units, I think we were calling them units 12 and 13 and various other sequential instantiations of, um, of previous year's unit units and taking it down to bedrock. So I was saying there isn't that much material culture at the site. And of course, this always happens as an archeologist, the last day or two of excavating, we found all of this um, right before we had to close up the site permanently. But this is some sort of, we've been calling it a crystal polisher, so possibly something that was used in making other artifacts. And then we found this idol, which um, nothing like it has, has really been seen before out of Bolorish. There, there is a history of sort of limestone uh, idols all over Portugal, and they have some really crazy stuff in museums in Lisbon that's definitely worth a look if you ever get the opportunity to visit. Um, but we finally had one from Bolorish, and so it was very, very exciting and we took multiple pictures, and we also found a pot that was about this big, which I would have been impressed with, except some of my friends work um, on Mississippian stuff, you know, around the area around Cahokia, and they have just enormous pots and pieces of ceramics. So I wasn't, I wasn't as enthusiastic about that, but we did find a pot. All right, um, this is what I call excavation yoga. So I'm <laughs> balancing precariously on a limestone slab, trying not to step on any bones, and trying to slowly remove sediment from around some sort of fragmentary remain. I was particularly, I, I put this picture in because I'm very proud of myself. Um, we'd found a portion of maxilla that I was excavating slowly, and I realized that the entire cranium was relatively com complete based on my knowledge of human anatomy, and I followed the orbit back, and we had almost the whole thing in situ, though it was very fragmentary, so this all, of course, fell apart as soon as I took it out. Um, but we had five or six crania in one unit this year, which was huge. Uh, and since a lot of the M&I work is based on tooth type, it was very useful to have all these, these teeth in there. Okay. All right, um, and then moving on to Spain, um, which is actually in reverse chronological order because I went there first, but it seemed to make the most sense. This is where I was doing some of my own pre-dissertation field work. So, um, when I went to Portugal, it was to work with a team I'd already worked with who had helped me garner some important connections with Iberian archaeologists generally. And as archeo in archaeology, as within any other field, name dropping and recognition of, um, of your peers is very important. So having worked on that project two seasons in a row helped me uh, be able to visit the, the museum in Cayenne. Um, and here, I was basically doing some very preliminary examination of a massive collection of human remains from a Copper Age site that's dated to approximately the same time period Belorish is the site I was working at previously. Um, yeah, so to give you an idea of the scale, this is the site. It's a massive enclosure site. Um, so big, big sort of ditches and walls were very popular in the Neolithic and the Copper Age. Think Stonehenge 
or any of those classic British Neolithic sites. Um, so this is the site. To give you a, s a feeling of the size of it, this is a football field, right? So this entire site is spread out underneath the modern city of Cayenne. And so it was salvage excavated back in the 90s, which um, means that it was excavated quickly in advance of urban expansion. So there's a ton of material, but not that many people have looked at it. Um, a good example of, of what it's like to be in the city and know that the site is underneath it, um, N4, which is Necropolis 4, it's called Marroquias Altos, is actually in here. In, it's basically in what someone's garage is now. So um, I think they've preserved a portion of it, but you spend a lot of time reading about this, and then they take you back out behind the museum and kind of go, oh, yeah, that's where, that's where Marroquias Altos is, that door. Um, so uh, that was definitely a fun part there. Um, Archaeologically, what's interesting is there's a number of different burial trajectories. So anything that says F is a Foso Comunes, anything that says N is a Necropolis, and there's also 20 to 30 household burials. Um, so I can ask a lot of different questions about who's being buried where. Like Belorish, it's all very fragmentary and commingled, but there's the potential for a lot of radiocarbon dating work to look at the chronology of this. So are some of these burial locations and burial treatments earlier than others? Are different people being buried there? Are the people buried in one place people who ate a very different diet to people being buried in another place? And what does the age structure look like? You know, are, are there only kids in one place? Are there any kids at all? Um, and so there's a, an enormous number of questions I can ask with this material. But no one has really studied it yet, so I had to go see what it looked like. It, it ranged in terms of completion. So this is one of the nicer crania that we have. Um, and then you have just bags and bags of bones. All of these are human remains. This is um, Pedro Diaz del Rio, who is one of my Spanish contacts. He's an archeologist out of Madrid. Um, there were maybe f three or four of these pallets of boxes full of human bones, and each box had something that looked like this in it. So there's just a vast amount of material. And I was, I was so excited because my advisor was very worried I would go and they would lay out maybe 20 individuals and go, yes, this is our massive collection. No, it is actually massive. So there's a lot of work to be done there. All right, and that is all. I'm sorry if I went over time. Um, yeah, but thank you to the CES for making this possible. It was a fantastic summer. I got to play with a lot of bones, which is my favorite thing to do. And also to my advisor for writing yet another last minute recommendation for me. <laughs> questions, yeah. What, what specifically attracted you to Iberia? Is there something about Neolithic um, sites there that you've learned something? Um, honestly, when I started here, I didn't have a specific regional direction. I knew I wanted to work in Europe because for personal reasons, I spent a lot of my time growing up in Europe. And so I would like, I wanted an opportunity to return. Um, but I kind of nosed around and tried to see who was doing excavations involving human remains. I'm interested in the Neolithic and Copper Age periods because it's a time of sort of nascent social complexity. And there's a lot of fascinating questions you can ask archeologically about things like social differentiation, rank, material culture, exchange networks, things of that nature. Um, and so I emailed Katina Lilios, who is at University of Iowa and directs the Belorish project. And I said, hi, you know, hi, I'm a, I'm a Michigan graduate student. Can I come work at your site? And she said, yes. And the door to Iberia was open. So that is why I worked there. Yes? I, I like the questions you try to figure out the answer to while you're on a dig. That was kind of interesting aspect of your lecture. Mm -hmm. um, one question I had about that is, um, you know, like in England, they had pauper's graves and things like that. Has there been any evidence uncovered uh, at your dig or uh, where you were um, that would indicate that um, wealthier people had separate cemeteries or burial grounds than the people who were, let's just say, working class or... You know, that's a that's a good question. We are talking about societies that are early farming communities, so they're likely going to have been so small that you're not getting those sort of social distinctions appearing yet, just because in terms of, of um, economies, you don't have that much differentiation. If you live in a community of 30 people, pretty much everyone's a farmer, unless you have some sort of ritual specialist, which is, um, I don't want to get into talking about chiefdoms because I will go on forever, but you know, a, po a possibility in some places. Um, Belorish is a good example of a communal burial that's likely linked to some sort of ancestral 
worship or tie to the land. Uh, archaeologically, generally, when you bury a lot of people in one place, it's, it's seen as a way of making a statement about your ties to the land and your people's ties to the land and your, your ancestral right to this area. Um, so at Belorish, interestingly, we have a lot of children um, and, and young individuals who are buried there, which is different to what you would expect for, um, for that sort of ancestor worship, because in a, lot of, in a lot of cultures and ethnographically, children aren't always considered people until a certain age. They're not considered social beings in the same way the rest of us are. Um, but at Belorish, you have all these kids. You have so many kids. So it's just a fascinating, unique site that says that something was going on there. Um, but in terms of that sort of social differentiation, you're not going to be seeing that much of it in the late Neolithic, early Copper Age. No. All right. Thanks. Our final speaker today is uh, William Lamping, who is pursuing a, a bachelor's degree here at the university in Russian and political science. Um, he did an internship at the Polish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and he's going to talk today about that experience. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, bear with me. This is the first time I've uh, used one of these. Let's see this. All right. So, um, it w while I, I did work in Poland in Warsaw uh, through a uh, Copernicus grant, it wasn't quite through the uh, Polish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. It was through um, one of the political parties in the European Parliament, uh, Polska Jest na Wyżnesia, which tra uh, loosely translate, translates as Poland Comes First. Now, it is, uh, it, it's, it's not an extreme party. I, I got a lot of questions about that. They're not like ultra-nationalists. It's, it's just they're emphasizing um, Poland's concerns within the European community. So I spent, uh, six, I spent six weeks in Warsaw, of which I spent five days in Strasbourg sitting in on a parliamentary session of the European Parliament. This is, uh, this is my boss, uh, Mr. Paweł Koval. He, uh, he's a uh, member of the European Parliament and he's also the head of PJN. He also happens to be the chair of the European U Ukraine Parliamentary Cooperation Committee, which we got to, we got to work uh, quite, quite often with. And he also happens to be one of the co-founders for the Warsaw Uprising Museum. Up, uh, up until uh, 2010, he was in uh, Law and Justice, the uh, ruling uh, political party f uh, until quite recently, uh, by which then, w which uh, he left in 2010 uh, to help uh, found PJN because he and the other founders felt that uh, Law and Justice were getting a little too right wing and we needed, we needed to bring things back towards uh, moderation. While, while I was in uh, Poland, I was working uh, almost exclusively with the European uh, Union's uh, Eastern Partnership, which is made out of seven uh, former Soviet republics, Belarus, Ukraine, Moldova, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia, as w uh, sp uh, specifically in helping foster uh, their democracies, uh, respect for human rights, as well as uh, border, border liberalization, especially between Poland and Ukraine. Um, eventually, uh, PJN's goal is to try to get Ukraine, to bring Ukraine into uh, the Europe, into the European Union. It's it's not it's not quite a, uh, completely a pan-European ideology. It's also to have um, a Slavic buddy to help us vote vote down Germany's proposals. <laughs> uh, and um, also, we worked a lot on digital copyright form because that was one of the key topics uh, that were. That that session of European Parliament you know, that I that I attended we were dealing with. So a little bit about the party. Um, they uh, they split off from Law and Justice when they felt that the that the the heads of, of Law and Justice were go, uh, getting a little too uh, far right. Um, the political platform deals primarily with social issues, especially um, maternity rights and and family uh, policy mostly with expanding government uh, programs, uh, making sure they're better funded uh, for Polish families. Um, although mostly what, uh, what I got to work with was their, the energy side of their platform, which um, is mostly dealing with uh, expanding Polish domestic energy consumption because of their, over, their heavy reliance on Russian energy, uh, which for political reasons is, is a, little, a little problematic 
because Russia has been known to play with prices to get what they want done. Um, <clears throat> Currently, unfortunately, PJN in the last Polish election um, did abysmally. They only got about 3%, they got about 1.7% of the vote, which is not enough to get any uh, delegates in the SIM. However, they did get three uh, within uh, the European Parliament uh, of, wi of the f uh, 51 Polish delegates designated, for, de designated within the Parliament. Um, within the European Parliament, they are, uh, they are allied uh, within the voting bloc of the European Conservatives and Reformists group, um, which, interestingly enough, is almost completely British and PJN dominated. And um, recently, Belarus's um, primary po uh, opposition party, which is the, now the BPF because, uh, because of parliamentary uh, elect electoral uh, law laws that have been recently changed, in Belarus, preventing them from being called the Belarusian uh, Popular Front. Let's see. Also, because they failed, because they failed to get any delegates within the SIM, they are funded uh, through private donations and Mr. Koval's uh, fundraisers. Incidentally, before he was in politics, he was a fellow at the Jagalonian at the Jagalonian University in Krakow, and he has uh, quite a few publications that bring in. Uh, some funding for the party. So a little bit about the European Parliament. It's it's a bit of a hybrid sy uh, system. It's based a little bit on the German Reichstag, a little bit on the Westminster parliamentary system, but um, it, it can get a little confusing and um, honestly it, it's, it's still a work in progress. Uh, there are 754 delegates which are divided amongst um, amongst all the, all the countries uh, based on their uh, percentage of population within the European Union. Each, however, each uh, country is designated at least six. So Malta, well, Malta which has about 60,000 people, has six, whereas Germany, I believe, is sitting at 101. They're, they are the largest, which, in, in, and, and, if, and also if Ukraine uh, enters, enters the European Union, then between, po then, um, between Poland and Ukraine, will, they will have enough votes to vote down anything Germany wants. Um, <laughs> which, which is quite often, actually. The, uh, the, beca because, of, um, because the delegates are divvied up uh, um, within each country based on uh, political ideals, the voting blocks within the European Parliament are pan-European. So, like I said, like ECR is, mo is, Brit is mostly British and Polish, um, and, and I believe we have a few um, Northern Italians. But... Uh, you know, th that's just one example. There are a lot, of, for example, like there are a lot of Swedes and, um, and now Greeks in the socialist, uh, the, uh, in the s the social, socialists and Democrats who are appropriately read. Um, the, of course, the EPP, the European People's Party, is the largest group right now. They, they tend to be mostly, they tend to be um, specifically moderates. Um, they're, they are, it looks like they're, they are destined to Lose, lose a lot of their delegates because of the way the Eurozone crisis has been held. At ECR, we're kind of happy about that because we have some ideas um, about what to do with those extra delegates. Uh, also, Parliament has 23 operating languages, which can be very problematic when uh, your committee chair wants to have everything done in Finnish. And <laughs> uh, thankfully, we were in uh, we were in Strasbourg, and. And because and because uh, for uh, a, a variety of reasons, the French were really pushing um, the use of French in all the committees. Everyone else uh, agreed to use only English, which made which made things a lot very easy. And we actually had, we could we were able to dispense with a lot of the interpreters at every at every session. You under European law, you're supposed to have at least twenty three uh, at least twenty three translators uh, to provide you know to provide uh, linguistic support for every language from Gaelic to Greek, to Polish, to, um, I think the, uh, the Malta has a specific language. Is it, I think it's Maltese. It's spoken by like 20,000 people, but it's still, it's still represented. Is, yes. is one of the languages? No, and the Catalonians the are not happy about it. Um, but a few of my daily tasks were, you know, I took notes and photographs at, at the various conferences that we, we both hosted and attended. Um, I was the only native English speaker in the offices, so they, they basically gave me um, anything they needed in English, 
and you know I, I, I ran with that. I wrote for their um, their their news their uh, party related news site Energy Alert. I, I actually I still do that, mostly dealing with energy issues. Um, I provided I gave uh, Mr. Koval a daily press briefing about everything going on in the European Union uh, in the European Union. With uh, though he did also tell me to include at least a little bit on the American uh, electoral cycle. Um, you know, I can promote speeches. I, I, I coordinated uh, various conferences. Actually, like on the last day of my internship, I was having having a real hard time contacting anyone in Hungary because for some reason they decided not to pick up the phone. Eventually, I was able to get a the Hungarian embassy to Panama to uh, to an to answer my calls. <laughs> Uh, so that, th that that was a fun time. Ultimately, they and decided not. To, they ended up not sending anyone to the the conference. But you know that that happens. Incidentally, I also ended up doing basically anything they told me to do. I remember one night, uh, uh, one night I finished I finished my work day at 3 a.m. Um, moving luggage and equipment across Warsaw. Um, but you know it turned out to be it turned out to be a good experience. Uh, you know it helped us helped us prepare for conferences and such. Um, our, the Warsaw office is located in the government district, which is uh, in Mokotov, which is the um, south side of Warsaw. It's near uh, Plac Unii Lubielski, which is one of the major um, uh, tram hubs in, in the town. Th this is my overseer, Mr. Marek Dobkowski. Uh, this, this right here is the entrance to the PJN um, headquarters. As you can tell, we have a very fancy building. It's a, it's, it's, Essentially, we, we rented a flat in, um, in a residential neighborhood near the Swedish embassy. Um, there are five permanent staffers in the Warsaw office. There are uh, another four in Brussels. Um, and, and as of now, I believe there's, we also have a Krakow office, which we're about to open. We have two, mem we have two people there. So we, we're a very small organization. Um, lessons learned. Learned uh, there's no such thing as bad publicity. And you just need to keep sending your message out there, no matter how many times. You need to you need to be able to con, uh, convey what you want. Even if you make a mistake, it's fine. People are going to remember your mistakes. Um, only only to a certain point, they're going to remember your ideas forever. Um, also, however, it does help to ha to show etiquette, to dress up, to have an inventive way of saying something that tends to, to stick around. But when you know your your basic platform is drill, baby, drill. And and more money for Polish families. You need to find invent. You need to find a lot of inventive ways of saying it, especially in European Parliament. You need a basic knowledge of a few languages. Um, if you want, you know, if you want, uh, you know, a, a bonjour or a guten tag will get you a whole lot, a, a whole lot, a uh, whole lot farther in trying to get someone to sign on to your petition. Um, then will uh, hello, can you help me? Especially if they're coming, you know, if they're coming from, if you know the happen to know the native language. Unfortunately, there's of course there's never enough time to do absolutely everything, uh, that, which is why they in my office they absolutely love having interns. I was one of three, uh, the only one from America though. We essentially, you know, there was there was a there was, a, there was a, just a structure. Marduk would tell would uh, hand, would divvy out all the tasks for the day, and um, everyone would word work in various um, sections of the office. Would decide what they wanted, and then then keep uh, sending things down the line through the hierarchy. I ended up having, um, I think, in one day, I was talking about Burmese Muslims, um, cops in Egypt, and Lukashen and President of Belarus's Lukashenko's um, deci decision to release all political prisoners on the eve on the end on the end date for the registration for Be Belarusian political parties. It was. It was. Very, it was. A, I had a very interesting browser history. There. Uh, <laughs> also, English language skills uh, are very, very important. I. I had to. You know. I had to look over um, a lot of their of the, a lot of their documents uh, because you know there are twenty three because there are five hundred million people in Europe in, within the European Union. There are twenty three operating languages. The the one modicum that everyone's got is English to to more or less degrees. So. Um, it, w it was quite interesting seeing uh, there was there's a lot of um, political capital in mastery of English, uh, while you know while, while deal working in Brussels or Strasbourg. Um, I have to say that this internship was very was very uh, enlightening for me. Um, it it definitely gave me 
a, a real perspective of what it meant to be a legislative assistant. And um, I believe I, succe I succeeded to PJN's uh, requirements because they actually offered me a job when I graduated, when, when I graduate in uh, May. So thank you, Chris. Uh, yes. Yes, I will. I, well, at, well, as of now, I, it's a tentative yes, you but still have time. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting on a, a few other people that I've sent uh, job applications to. Yes. I have a question. Um, the the political group that this party belongs to in European Parliament mm -hmm. includes kind of center right parties in other countries that are mm -hmm. all strong on national defense, are all, str in some ways, mm -hmm. in one form or another, take strong nationalist line. How do they view each other? And how, in what way do, do parties whose, whose sort of, you know, essence is a mm -hmm. kind of strong particularism, that is, mm -hmm. a strong national identity, yes. how do they cooperate? I mean, what, what, what do they, what, what, in fact, what kinds of incentives mm -hmm. do they have to cooperate? The, well, um, Actually, let me just follow it up. Yeah, because like a lot of interesting things have been going on in Hungary, for example. Yes, with, with, and, and I was interested to hear you were inviting the Hungarians. Like, what to, mm -hmm. what, to what extent are people concerned or interested in these kinds of developments? Um, um in other to, I mean, the yeah. 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 the prime minister is in jail, and yeah. the prime minister. Oh, the, the former prime minister. Former prime minister. <laughs> She's uh, officially in disgrace, but actually, Mr. Actually, Mr. Koval is also a good friend of Yulia Timoshenko. Um, well, it, it was very interesting because uh, the ECR is actually. If I can probably go back to that, the ECR is actually one of two center center right groups um, because. Oh, here we go. Because uh, we, we we are we are about we're like half of the strong on on the national identity. Uh, political parties, because the other half um, have usually have irredentist claims to uh, p portions of our countries. Like we do, we do not have any Slovaks, we do not have any Germans, and we definitely don't have any Lithuanians in our in ECR. However, we do have um, we do have a lot of Brits. We've got a qu we have the Hungarians are there, and um, we also have a, we have a few Italians. The other group, the um, I believe it's the Orange Group EFD. I forget what the, the acronym is for, but that's where you see the German nationalists who consider Poland to be, you know, Ostdeutschland and, and, fun, and fun times like that. Um, so, yeah, there, there, is, there is some friction between nationalist groups, but um, at least in recent years, it really hasn't been uh, butting heads over territory. It's been more about uh, Eurozone crisis and, and um, you know, what, what are, like how much power is actually going to, the, you know, the, the European Commission and how much of that's going to be sacrificed by the uh, member republics as, as we, uh, you know, as we, well, member states. As we saw, like, in July, actually, that it, it was a bit of a uh, bit of an uproar. Uh, Spain had to give up control of its central bank to the European Commission, which um, ac actually they, well I, well, I guess it's okay to talk about now, but a few of their parties actually sent feelers uh, to our, head, our headquarters to talk about uh, joining ECR. Because, um, in response to, in response to that, because there was definitely a, a huge voter backlash um, against that against surrendering the uh, um, uh, amongst other things surrendering the central bank to the European Commission. Um, ECR ECR stance on on national issues is um, try to preserve as much power within the, each member state as possible. Um, you know they they basically view the so the European Union as uh, as a a, uh, you know, a, a cooperative effort of equal members of people who will uh, of of states that will cooperate, but do not, but will not, but refuse to be dominated by the by the by the center, which is which is another reason why we don't have any French or Germans in ECR. You you can find those them in uh, either EPP or EFD. EPP being the light blue turquoise faction. Any other questions? Thanks very All much. Right. Thank you.